Office. Today, we'll review the important doctrines and jurisprudence in constitutional law. Let's get started. What is meant by the doctrine of constitutional supremacy? Under this doctrine, if a law violates any norm of the Constitution, that law is null and void and without any force and effect. Thus, since the Constitution is the fundamental, paramount, and supreme law of the nation, it is deemed written in every statute and contract. Under our constitutional scheme, judicial supremacy is never judicial superiority or judicial tyranny. Instead, judicial supremacy's objective is asserting and promoting the supremacy of the Constitution. How do you distinguish an amendment from revision? Amendment refers to an addition or change within the lines of the original constitution as will effect an improvement or better carry out the purpose for which it is framed. It refers to a change that adds, reduces, or deletes without altering the basic principles involved. It affects only the specific provision being amended. Revision broadly implies a change that alters a basic principle in the Constitution, like altering the principle of separation of powers or the system of checks and balances. There is also revision if the change alters the substantial entirety of the Constitution as when the change affects the substantial provisions therein. This distinction is significant because the 1987 Constitution allows people's initiative only for the purpose of amending, not revising, the Constitution. What are the two tests to determine if the proposal is amendment or revision? The first test is quantitative test, which asks whether the proposed change is so extensive in its provisions as to change directly the substantial entirety of the Constitution by the deletion or alteration of numerous existing provisions. The court examines only the number of provisions affected and does not consider the degree of the change. Meanwhile, qualitative test inquires into the qualitative effect of the proposed change in the Constitution. The main inquiry is whether the change will accomplish such far-reaching changes in the nature of our basic governmental plan as to amount to a revision. Whether there is an alteration in the structure of government is a proper subject of inquiry. In Lambino v. Comelec, under both the quantitative and qualitative tests, the Lambino Group's initiative is a revision and not merely an amendment. Quantitatively, the Lambino Group's proposed changes overhaul two articles, Article 6 on the Legislature and Article 7 on the Executive, affecting a total of 105 provisions in the entire Constitution. Qualitatively, the proposed changes alter substantially the basic governmental plan from presidential to parliamentary and from bicameral to a unicameral legislature. The change may May generally be considered an amendment and not a revision if it applies only to specific provision without affecting other sections or articles. For example, a change reducing the voting age from 18 years to 15 years is an amendment. Another, a change reducing Filipino ownership of mass media companies from 100% to 60% is an amendment. And third, a change requiring a college degree as an additional qualification for election to the presidency is also an amendment not a revision. What are the three ways of proposing amendments? First, Congress may directly propose amendment or revision by three-fourth votes of all its members. In such a case, Congress will not be acting as a legislative body, but rather as a constituent assembly, a non-legislative function of Congress. Second is through a constitutional convention. A constitutional convention is a body separate and distinct from that of the Congress itself, whose members shall be elected by the people of their respective districts. There are two ways by which a constitutional convention may be convened. First, Congress may directly call a constitutional convention by two third votes of all its members. Second, instead of directly calling a constitutional convention, Congress by majority vote of all its members may submit the question of whether or not to call a convention to be resolved by the people in a plebiscite. And third mode is through people's initiative. People's initiative on the constitution is done through a petition, but the petition will have to be signed by at least 12% of the total number of registered voters, provided that in each legislative district, at least 
3% of the registered voters therein shall sign the petition. People's initiative on the Constitution is limited only to proposing amendments to the Constitution, not revision thereof. What is the effect of an unconstitutional law? Under the orthodox view, an unconstitutional act is not a law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duties. It affords no protection. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation, inoperative as though it had never been passed. The modern view, however, provides the certain legal effects of the statute prior to its declaration of unconstitutionality may be recognized. As a matter of equity and fair play, the Supreme Court in some cases applied the doctrine of operative fact. What is operative fact doctrine? The operative fact doctrine recognizes the existence of the law or executive act prior to the determination of its unconstitutionality as an operative fact that produces consequences that cannot always be erased, ignored, or disregarded. In short, it nullifies the void law or executive act but sustains its effects. It provides an exception to the general rule that a void or unconstitutional law produces no effect, but its use must be subjected to great scrutiny and circumspection, and it cannot be invoked to validate an unconstitutional law or executive act, but is resorted to only as a matter of equity and fair play. What comprises the national territory of the Philippines? The national territory comprises the Philippine archipelago, with all the islands and waters embraced therein, and all other territories over which the Philippines has sovereignty and jurisdiction, consisting of its terrestrial, fluvial, and aerial domains, including its territorial sea, the seabed, the subsoil, the insular shelves, and other submarine areas. This provision is an express declaration that the Philippines is an archipelago. An archipelago is a body of water studded with islands. The clause, all other territories over which the Philippines has sovereignty or jurisdiction, includes any territory which presently belongs to the Philippines or might in the future belong to the Philippines through any of the internationally accepted modes of acquiring territory. The waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago, regardless of their breathing dimensions, form part of the internal waters of the Philippines. This sentence is an affirmation of the archipelagic doctrine under which we connect the outermost points of our archipelago with straight baselines and consider all the waters enclosed thereby as internal waters. The entire archipelago is regarded as one integrated unit instead of being fragmented into so many thousand islands. How do we draw our baselines? Imaginary straight lines are drawn joining the outermost points of the archipelago enclosing an area the ratio of which should not be more than 9 is to 1 water is to land, provided that the drawing of baselines shall not depart to any appreciable extent from the general configuration of the archipelago. The waters within the baselines shall be considered internal waters, while the breadth of the territorial sea shall then be measured from the baselines. Baselines are lines drawn along the low water mark of an island or group of islands which mark the end of the internal waters and the beginning of the territorial sea. Is RA 9522 or the Maritime Baseline Law unconstitutional? In Magaliona v. Ermita, the Supreme Court ruled that RA 9522 is not unconstitutional. RA 9522 shortened one baseline, optimized the location of some base points around the Philippine archipelago, classified adjacent territories namely the Calayan Island Group and the Scarborough Shoal as regime of islands whose islands generate their own applicable maritime zones. RA 9522 is a statutory tool to demarcate the country's maritime zones and continental shelf under UNCLUS 3, not to delineate Philippine territory. UNCLUS 3 has nothing to do with the acquisition or loss of territory. It is a multilateral treaty regulating, among others, sea use rights over maritime zones. That is, the territorial waters is 12 nautical miles from the baselines, 
contiguous zone is 24 nautical miles from the baseline, exclusive economic zone is 200 nautical miles from the baseline, and continental shelves that unclus 3 delimits. Thus, baseline laws are nothing but statutory mechanisms for unclus 3 state parties to delimit with precision the extent of their maritime zones and continental shelves. In turn, this gives notice to the rest of the international community of the scope of the maritime space and submarine areas within which state parties exercise treaty-based rights, namely the exercise of sovereignty over territorial waters, the jurisdiction to enforce customs, fiscal, immigration, and sanitary laws in the contiguous zone, and the right to exploit the living and non-living resources in the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. Is the state immune from suit? As a rule, the state may not be sued without its consent. This is also known as the royal prerogative of dishonesty, a constitutional doctrine of non-suability of the state, privilege it grants the state to defeat any legitimate claim against it by simply invoking its non-suability. There are many reasons why the state is immune from suit. First, Indiscriminate suit against the state will result in the impairment of its dignity, being a challenge to its supposed infallibility. Second, this is based on the logical and practical ground that there can be no legal right against the authority which makes the law on which the right depends. Is the rule absolute? The rule is not really absolute, for it does not say that the state may not be sued under any circumstances. On the other hand, the doctrine only conveys the state may not be sued without its consent. Its clear import then is that the state may at times be sued. The state's consent may be given either expressly or impliedly. Express consent is manifested through general law and special law. For general law, we have Act Number 3083 which provides that the government of the Philippine Islands consents and submits to be sued upon any moneyed claim involving liability arising from contract, express or implied, which could serve as basis of civil action between private parties. Commonwealth Act Number 327 as amended by Presidential Decree Number 1445 provides that a claim against the government must first be filed with the Commission on Audit which must act upon it within 60 days. Rejection of the claim will authorize the claimant to elevate the matter to the Supreme Court on certiorari and in effect sue the state without its consent. Another general law is Article 2180 of the New Civil Code which provides that the state is responsible in like manner when it acts through a special agent. Article 2189 of the Civil Code also provides that provinces, cities, and municipalities shall be liable for damages for the death of or injury suffered by any person by reason of the defective condition of roads, streets, bridges, public buildings, and other public works under their control or supervision. The express consent of the state to be sued must be embodied in a duly enacted statute and may not be given by mere counsel of the government. There is implied consent when the government engages in commercial or business transaction. In such a case, the government is suable. As an exception, however, it is not suable if it is merely incidental to the exercise of its principal governmental function. Implied consent is also given when the government enters into a proprietary contract or when the government initiates the filing of a complaint for affirmative relief, then that is considered as a waiver of its immunity. What do you understand by the doctrine of incorporation? Section 2, Article 2 of the 1987 Constitution provides that the Philippines adopts the generally accepted principles of international law as part of the laws of the land. This provision is an affirmation of our adherence to the doctrine of incorporation in international law. Under the 1987 Constitution, an international law can become part of the sphere of domestic law either by transformation or or incorporation. The transformation method requires that an international law be transformed into a domestic law through a constitutional mechanism such as local legislation. On the other hand, generally accepted principles of international law by virtue of the incorporation clause of the constitution form part of the laws of the land even if they do not derive from 
treaty stipulations. Generally accepted principles of international law include international customs as evidence of a general practice accepted as law and general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. International customary rules are accepted as binding as a result from the combination of two elements, the established, widespread, and consistent practice on the part of states and a psychological element known as opinio iuris civi necessitatis or opinion as to law or necessity. Implicit in the latter element is a belief that the practice in question is rendered obligatory by the existence of a rule of law requiring it. General principles of law recognized by civilized nations are principles established by a process of reasoning or judicial logic based on principles which are basic to legal systems generally such as general principles of equity, general principles of fairness and justice, and the general principles against discrimination. These are the same core principles which underlie the Philippine Constitution itself and embodied in the Due Process and Equal Protection Clause. Benevolent Neutrality Approach In Estrada v. Escritor, the Supreme Court dismissed the immorality charges against Escritor based on her having cohabited with a person other than her husband upon finding said arrangement was sanctioned under her religion. The Supreme Court invoked the Benevolent Neutrality Approach which gives room for accommodation of religious exercises as required by the Free Exercise Clause and for accommodation of morality based on religion provided it does not not offend compelling state interests. The benevolent neutrality theory believes that with respect to these governmental actions, accommodation of religion may be allowed not to promote the government's favored form of religion but to allow individuals and groups to exercise their religion without hindrance. The purpose of accommodation is to remove a burden on or facilitate the exercise of a person or institution's religion. In Escritor, the court held that conjugal arrangement cannot be penalized as she has made out a case for exemption from the law based on her fundamental right to freedom of religion. In the area of religious exercise as a preferred freedom, man stands accountable to an authority higher than the state, and so the state interest sought to be upheld must be so compelling that its violation will erode the very fabric of the state that will also protect the freedom. In the absence of a showing such state interest exists, man must be allowed to subscribe to the infinite. Right to Life of the Unborn The Philippine National Population Program has always been grounded on two cornerstone principles, the principle of no abortion and the principle of non-coercion. These principles are not merely grounded on administrative policy, but rather originates from the constitutional protection which expressly provided to afford protection to life and guarantee religious freedom. The policy of the law is to protect the fertilized ovium and that it should be afforded safe travel to the uterus for implantation. Intergenerational Responsibility In Oposa versus Factoran, an action was filed by several minors represented by their parents against the DNR to cancel existing timber license agreements in the country and to stop issuance of new ones. It was claimed that the resultant deforestation and damage to the environment violated their constitutional rights to a balanced and healthful ecology and right to health. Do minors have cause of action to prevent misappropriation or impairment of Philippine rainforest? Do they have the legal standing to file the case? The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the minors. This case has a special and novel element. Petitioners who are minors assert that they represent their generation as well as generations yet unborn. The Supreme Court found no difficulty in ruling that they can, for themselves, for others of their generation, and for the succeeding generations, file a class suit. Their personality to sue in behalf of the succeeding generations can only be based on the concept of intergenerational responsibility insofar as the right to a balanced and healthful ecology is concerned. Such right considers the rhythm and harmony of nature. Nature means the created world in its entirety. Such rhythm and harmony indispensably include the judicious disposition, utilization, management, renewal, and conservation of the country's natural resources to the end that their exploration, development, and 
utilization be equitably accessible to the present as well as future generations. Needless to say, every generation has a responsibility to the next to preserve that rhythm and harmony for the full enjoyment of a balanced and healthful ecology. Put a little differently, the Supreme Court said the miners' assertion of their right to a sound environment constitutes, at the same time, the performance of their obligation to ensure the protection of that right for the generations to come. Precautionary Principle Under this rule, the precautionary principle finds direct application in the evaluation of evidence in cases before the courts. This bridges the gap in cases where scientific certainty in factual findings cannot be achieved. By applying this principle, the court may construe a set of facts as warranting either judicial action or inaction with the goal of preserving and protecting the environment. Hence, bias is created in favor of the constitutional right of the people to a balanced and healthful ecology. In effect, the precautionary principle shifts the burden of evidence of harm away from those likely to suffer harm and onto those desiring to change the status quo. An application of the precautionary principle to the rules on evidence will enable courts to tackle future environmental problems before ironclad scientific consensus emerges. For purposes of evidence, the precautionary principle should be treated as a principle of last resort where application of regular rules and evidence would cause in an inequitable result for the plaintiff. When in doubt, cases must be resolved in favor of the constitutional right to balance and healthful ecology. Citizenship. Citizenship is a personal and more or less permanent membership in a particular community. It denotes possession within that particular political community of full civil and political rights subject to special disqualifications such as minority. Reciprocally, it imposes the duty of allegiance to the political community. The modes of acquiring citizenship are by birth through jus sanguinis or acquisition of citizenship on the basis of blood relationship and jus soli or acquisition of citizenship on the basis of place of birth. Another mode is by naturalization. The Philippine law on citizenship adheres to the principle of jus sanguinis. Thereunder, a child follows the nationality or citizenship of the parents regardless of the place of birth as opposed to the doctrine of jus soli which determines nationality or citizenship on the basis of place of birth. Natural born citizens are those citizens of the Philippines from birth without having to perform any act to acquire or perfect their citizenship. The following are citizens of the Philippines. Those who are citizens of the Philippines at the time of the adoption of the 1987 Constitution. Those whose fathers or mothers are citizens of the Philippines. Those born before January 17, 1973 of Filipino mothers who elect Philippine citizenship upon reaching the age of majority. And those who are naturalized in accordance with law. Foundlings are considered natural-born Filipino citizens. The laws that recognize the citizenship of foundlings are number 1. The Constitution Deliberations of the 1934 Constitutional Convention show that the framers intended foundlings to be covered in the enumeration of citizens of Philippines under the 1935 Constitution. While the 1935 Constitution's enumeration is silent as to foundlings, there is no restrictive language which would definitely exclude the foundlings. This inclusive policy is carried over into the 19. 1973 and 1987 Constitution. Second, domestic laws on adoption illuminate that foundlings are Filipinos. While said law does not provide that adoption confers citizenship upon the adoptee, the adoptee must be a Filipino in the first place to be adopted. As adoption deals with status, courts will have jurisdiction only if the adoptee is a Filipino. International laws like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights recognize the nationality of foundlings. The common thread of the UDHR, UNCRC, and ICCPR is to obligate the Philippines to grant nationality from birth and to ensure that no child is stateless. This grant of nationality must be at the time of birth. Moreover, the 1930 Hague Convention on Certain Questions Relating to the Conflict of Nationality Laws and 1961 United Nations Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness, while not ratified by the Philippines, the 
the provisions contained therein are considered generally accepted principles of international law by virtue of the incorporation clause under our present constitution, the said principles are considered part of the laws of the land. Republic Act 11767, Foundling Recognition and Protection Act. A foundling found in the Philippines and or in Philippine embassies, consulates, and territories abroad is presumed natural-born Filipino citizen regardless of the status or circumstances of birth. A foundling is accorded with rights and protections at the moment of birth equivalent to those belonging to such class of citizens whose citizenship does not need perfection or any further act. The presumption of natural-born status of a foundling may not be impugned in any proceeding unless substantial proof of foreign parentage is shown. Lastly, status is not affected by the fact that the birth certificate was simulated or that there was absence of a legal adoption process or that there was inaction or delay in reporting, documenting, or registering a foundling. The party list system. The party list system is intended to democratize political power by giving political parties that cannot win in legislative district elections a chance to win seats in the House of Representatives. The voter elects two representatives in the House of Representatives, one for his legislative district and another for his party list group or organization of choice. In Ang Atong Paglawang versus Comelec, the Supreme Court ruled that there are three different groups that may participate in the party list system. 1. The national parties or organizations. 2. Regional parties or organizations. And 3. Sectoral parties or organizations. National parties or organizations and regional parties or organizations do not need to organize along sectoral lines and do not need to represent any marginalized and underrepresented sector. Political parties can participate in party list elections provided they register under the party list system and do not field candidates in legislative district elections. A political party, whether major or not, that fields candidates in legislative district elections can participate in party list elections through its sectoral wing that can separately register under the party list system. The sectoral wing is by itself an independent sectoral party and is linked to a political party through a coalition. Sectoral parties or organizations may either be marginalized and underrepresented or lacking in well-defined political constituencies. It is enough that their principal advocacy pertains to the special interests and concerns of their sector. The sectors that are marginalized and underrepresented include labor, peasant, fisher folk, urban poor, indigenous cultural communities, handicapped, veterans, and overseas workers. The sector that lack well-defined political constituencies include professionals, the elderly, women, and the youth. A majority of the members of sectoral parties or organizations that represent the marginalized and underrepresented must belong to the marginalized and underrepresented sector they represent. Similarly, a majority of the members of the sectoral parties or organizations that lack well-defined political constituencies must belong to the sector they represent. As for the nominees of sectoral parties or organizations that represent the marginalized and underrepresented or that represent those who lack well-defined political constituencies, the new guidelines provide that they must either be member of the sectors or must have a track record of advocacy for their respective sectors. On the other hand, the nominees of national and regional parties or organizations must be bona fide members of such parties or organizations. Should some nominees of the national, regional, and sectoral parties or organizations are disqualified, the party or organization itself will Will not be disqualified provided that they have at least one nominee who remains qualified. Under the Constitution, the party list representatives shall constitute 20% of the total number of representatives, including those under the party list. Based on this, the ratio is 4 is to 1. That is, for every 4 district representatives, there should be one party list representative. In the computation of the number of seats allocated to party list representatives, Fractional representation is not allowed as it will exceed the 20% allocated seats for party list representatives and therefore will violate the Constitution. In such a case, what should be done is simply to disregard the fraction.
the Supreme Court also ruled that in computing the allocation of additional seats, the continued operation of the 2% threshold for the distribution of the additional seats as found in the second clause of Section 11, Paragraph B of RA 7941 is unconstitutional. The 2% threshold makes it mathematically impossible to achieve the maximum number of available party list seats when the number of available party list seats exceed 50. The continued operation of the 2% threshold in the distribution of the additional seats frustrates the attainment of the permissive ceiling that 20% of the members of the House of Representatives shall consist of party list representatives. The pork barrel system. The pork barrel system refers to the practice that governed the manner by which lump sum discretionary funds, primarily intended for local projects, are utilized through the respective participations of the legislative and executive branches of the government, including its members. The pork barrel system involves two kinds of lump sum discretionary funds. We have the congressional pork barrel, wherein legislators either individually or collectively organized into committees are able to effectively control certain aspects of the fund's utilization through various post-enactment measures and practices. Second is the presidential pork barrel, which allows the president to determine the manner of its utilization. The Supreme Court in Belhica v. Ochoa ruled that the pork barrel system is unconstitutional due to the following violations. First, it violates the principle of separation of powers. It has allowed legislators to wield in varying gradations non-oversight post-enactment authority in vital areas of budget execution. Second, it violated the principle of non-delegability of legislative power insofar as it has conferred unto legislators the power of appropriation by giving them personal discretionary funds from which they're able to fund specific projects which they themselves determine. Third, it denied the president the power to veto items insofar as it has created a system of budgeting wherein items are not textualized into the appropriations bill. It has flouted the prescribed procedure of presentment. Fourth, it impaired public accountability insofar as it has diluted the effectiveness of congressional oversight by giving legislators a stake in the affairs of budget execution, an aspect of governance which they may be called to monitor and scrutinize. Fifth, it subverted genuine local autonomy insofar as it has authorized legislators who are national officers to intervene in affairs of purely local nature despite the existence of capable local institutions. And lastly, it transgressed the principle of non-delegability insofar as it has conferred to the president the power to appropriate funds intended by law for energy-related purposes only to other purposes he may deem fit as well as other public funds under the broad classification of priority infrastructure development projects. Power of Augmentation The transfer of appropriated funds to be valid under the Constitution must be made upon the concurrence of the following requisites. Number 1. There is a law authorizing the President, the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the heads of the Constitutional Commissions, to transfer funds within their respective offices. Second, the funds to be transferred are savings generated from the appropriations of their respective offices. And third, the purpose of the transfer is to augment an item in the general appropriations law for their respective offices. Legislative Inquiry The Senate and the House of Representatives may conduct inquiries in aid of legislation. The inquiry, to be within the jurisdiction of the legislative body making it, must be material or necessary to the exercise of a power in it vested by the Constitution, such as to legislate or to expel a member. It follows then that the rights of persons under the Bill of Rights must be respected, including the right to due process and the right not to be compelled to testify against oneself. In Bingzon Jr. v. Senate Blue Ribbon Committee, two issues were raised. First, is the power to conduct inquiries in aid of legislation absolute? And second, is the power subject to judicial review? A mere reading of the codal provision will show that the power is not really absolute, hence there are three limitations. Number one, the inquiry must be in aid of legislation. Second, it must be conducted in accordance with the duly published rules of procedure of a House of Congress conducting such inquiry 
And third, the rights of persons appearing in or affected by such inquiry shall be respected. Since the power is not absolute, it therefore follows that such is subject to judicial review, especially in view of the expanded power of the court to determine whether or not there has been grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of the government. Oversight Functions of Congress the heads of departments may, upon their own initiative, with the consent of the President or upon the request of either House, as the rules of each House shall provide, appear before and be heard by such House on any matter pertaining to their departments. The Congress has the power to question department heads, the objective of which is to obtain information in pursuit of Congress's oversight function. Here, attendance is discretionary, hence, it is valid for the President to require that consent be obtained first before heads appear in Congress during question R. Resultantly, Congress cannot require the appearance of executive officials if the required consent of the President is not obtained first or if no such consent is given. Exemption from Taxation of Religious, Charitable, and Educational Institutions Charitable institutions, churches, and personages or convents appurtenant thereto, mosques, non-profit cemeteries, and all lands, buildings, and improvements actually, directly, and exclusively used for religious, charitable, or educational purposes shall be exempt from taxation. As a rule, there must be proof of the actual and direct use of the land, building, and improvements for religious, charitable, or educational purposes to be exempt from taxation. Question. Is the portion of the school building utilized as a cafeteria subject to real property tax? In Commissioner of Internal Revenue versus De La Salle, the Supreme Court ruled that it is subject to real property tax. The test of exemption from real property taxation is the use of the property. The lease of a portion of a school building for commercial purposes removes such asset from the property tax exemption granted under the Constitution. There is no exemption because the asset is not used actually, directly, and exclusively for educational purposes. The commercial use of the property is also not incidental to and reasonably necessary for the accomplishment of the main purpose of a university, which is to educate its students. Executive Power the executive power shall be vested in the President of the Philippines. As the chief executive, he has the power to enforce and administer laws. The presidential power of control over the executive branch of the government is a self-executing provision of the Constitution and does not require statutory implementation nor may its exercise be limited, much less withdrawn by Congress. The President, as the sole repository of executive power, is the guardian of the Philippine territory. To carry out this important duty, the President is equipped with authority over the armed forces of the Philippines, which is the protector of the people and the state. The faithful execution clause, as an obligation imposed on the President, is not a separate grant of power. The Constitution expresses this duty in no uncertain terms and includes it in the provision regarding the President's power of control over the Executive Department. Hence, the duty to faithfully execute the laws of the land is inherent in the executive power and is intimately related to the other executive functions. This mandate is self-executory by virtue of its being inherently executive in nature. In light of this constitutional duty, it is the President's prerogative to do whatever is legal and necessary for Philippine defense interests. Executive Privilege Executive privilege is the power of the President to withhold certain types of information from the courts, the Congress, and ultimately the public. This involves conversations and correspondence between the President and the public official, military, diplomatic, and other national security matters which, in the interest of national security, should not be divulged, information between intergovernment agencies prior to conclusion of treaties and executive agreements, discussion in closed-door cabinet meetings, or matters affecting national security 
and public order. The claim of executive privilege must be stated with sufficient particularity to enable Congress or the court to determine its legitimacy. Absent a statement of specific basis, there is no way to determine whether or not it falls under one of the traditional privileges or its circumstances should be respected. The privilege is said to be necessary to guarantee the candor of presidential advisors and to provide the president and those who assist him with freedom to explore alternatives in the process of shaping policies and making decisions, and to do so in a way many would be unwilling to express except privately. Note that executive privilege is not absolute. It must be weighed against other constitutionally recognized interests such as full disclosure of transactions involving public interest, the right of the people to information on matters of public concern, accountability of public officers, power of legislative inquiry, or judicial power to secure testimonial and documentary evidence in deciding cases. Ultimately, the balancing of interest between executive privilege on one hand and the other competing constitutionally recognized interests on the other hand is a function of the courts. The courts will have to decide the issue based on the factual circumstances of the case. Power of control. Power of control implies the power of an officer to manage, direct, govern, including the power to alter, modify, or set aside what a subordinate had done in the performance of his duties and to substitute his judgment for that of the latter. The president's power of control includes the power to reorganize the executive offices. Reorganization involves the reduction in personnel, consolidation of offices or even abolition of positions by reason of economy or redundancy of functions. While the power to abolish an office is generally lodged with Congress, the authority of the president to reorganize the executive department, which may include abolition, is permissible under the present laws. Power of supervision. Supervision means overseeing. The officer sees to it that subordinate officers perform their duties. If the subordinates fail or neglect to fulfill them, then the officer may take such action or steps as prescribed by law. In short, the officer merely sees to it that the rules are followed, but he does not lay down such rules, nor does he have the discretion to modify or replace them. At present, the president exercises general supervision over local government units and the autonomous regions. Doctrine of Qualified Political Agency This doctrine recognizes the establishment of a single executive department. All department heads are alter egos of the president, and except in cases where the chief executive is required by the constitution or law to act in person, or the exigencies of the situation demand that he act personally, the multifarious executive and administrative functions of the chief executive are performed by and through the executive departments, and the acts of the secretaries of such departments performed and promulgated in the regular course of business are, unless disapproved or reprobated by the chief executive, is presumably the acts of the chief executive. Power of appointment. The appointing power is the exclusive prerogative of the president. No limitations may be imposed by Congress except those resulting from the need of securing the concurrence of the commission on appointments. Second, all other officers of the government whose appointments are not otherwise provided for by law. Third, those whom the president may be authorized by law to appoint. Fourth, Officers lower in rank whose appointments the Congress may by law vest in the President. It is well settled that only presidential appointment belonging to the first group require the confirmation by the Commission on Appointments. In short, with respect to appointments involving the heads of the executive departments, ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, officers of the armed forces of the Philippines from the rank of colonel or naval captain, and other officers whose appointments are vested in him the constitution, 
this group of appointees require the confirmation by the Commission on Appointments. Also take note on the distinction between regular and ad interim appointment. Regular appointment is one made by the President while Congress is in session. It takes effect only after confirmation by the Commission on Appointments and once approved, it continues until the end of the term of the appointee. Ad interim appointment is one made by the President while Congress is not in session. It takes effect immediately but ceases to be valid if disapproved by the Commission on Appointments or upon the next adjournment of Congress. Midnight appointment. Two months immediately before the next presidential elections and up to the end of his term, a president shall not make appointments except temporary appointments to executive positions when continued vacancies therein will prejudice public service or endanger public safety. After the proclamation of the election of new president, the outgoing president is no more than a caretaker. The prohibition on midnight appointment applies only to presidential appointees. There is no law that prohibits local elective officials from making appointments during the last days of his tenure. Also, the prohibition does not extend to appointments in the judiciary because the establishment of the Judicial and Bar Council and their subjecting the nomination and screening of candidates for judicial positions to the unheard and deliberate prior process of the JBC ensured that there would no longer be midnight appointments to the judiciary. Indeed, the creation of the JBC was precisely intended to depoliticize the judiciary by doing away with the intervention of the Commission on Appointments. Military Powers of the President The President shall be the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Philippines and, whenever it becomes necessary, he may call out such armed forces to prevent or suppress lawless violence, invasion, or rebellion. Second, he has the power to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. And third, to place the Philippines or any part thereof under martial law in case of invasion or rebellion when the public safety requires it. What are the effects of the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus? The suspension of the privilege of the writ applies only to persons judicially charged for rebellion or offenses inherent in or directly connected with invasion. Such persons suspected of the above crimes can be arrested and detained without a warrant of arrest. The suspension of the privilege does not make the arrest without warrant legal. The arrest without warrant is justified by the emergency situation and the difficulty in applying for a warrant considering the time and the number of persons to be arrested. However, during the suspension of the privilege of the writ, any person thus arrested or detained shall be judicially charged within three days. Otherwise, he shall be released. The effect of the suspension of the privilege, therefore, is only to extend the periods during which he can be detained without a warrant. When the privilege is suspended, the period is extended to 72 hours. Martial law. Martial law is essentially a police power. What is peculiar about martial law as a police power is that, whereas police power is normally a function of the legislature executed by civilian executive arm, under martial law, police power is exercised by the executive with the aid of the military. What is the role of Congress during martial law? Congress may revoke the proclamation of martial law or suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus before the lapse of 60 days from the date of suspension or proclamation. When it's so revoked, the president cannot set aside or veto the revocation as he normally would do in the case of bills. What is the role of the Supreme Court during martial law? The Supreme Court may review in the appropriate proceeding filed by any citizen the sufficiency of the factual basis of the proclamation of martial law and even the suspension of the privilege of the writ or the extension thereof. The Supreme Court must promulgate its decision within 30 days from its filing.
And take note, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court may be invoked in a proper case. Expanded power of judicial review. The Constitution vests judicial power in the Supreme Court and in such lower courts as may be established by law. The Constitution states that judicial power includes the duty of the courts of justice not only to settle actual controversies involving rights which are legally demandable and enforceable, but also to determine whether or not there has been a grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of the government. Grave abuse of discretion means capricious and whimsical exercise of judgment as is equivalent to lack of jurisdiction. The abuse of discretion must be patent and gross as to amount to an evasion of a positive duty or a virtual refusal to perform a duty enjoined by law or to act at all in contemplation of law, as where the power is exercised in an arbitrary and despotic manner by reason of passion or hostility. The Constitution has thereby expanded the concept of judicial power which, up to then, was confined to its traditional ambit of settling actual controversies involving rights that are legally demandable and enforceable. The background and rationality of the expansion of judicial power under the 1987 Constitution is due to the great responsibility of the judiciary in maintaining the allocation of powers among the three branches of the government. Requisites of judicial review. First, there must be an actual case or controversy. This means that there must be a genuine conflict of legal rights and interests which can be resolved through judicial determination. Otherwise, the court will not decide the question of law when there is no actual case or controversy unless there is first, grave violation of the Constitution, second, paramount public interests involved, third, the constitutional issue raised requires formulation of controlling principles to guide the bench, the bar, and the public, fourth, the case is capable of repetition yet evading review, or fifth, when the subject in issue is of transcendental importance. The second requisite is, the person challenging the act must have the legal standing to challenge. A proper party is one who has sustained or is in eminent danger of sustaining a direct injury as a result of the act complained of. Third requisite, question must be raised at the earliest opportunity. As a general rule, the question of constitutionality must be raised at the earliest opportunity so that if not raised by the pleadings, ordinarily, it may not be raised at the trial. And if not raised in the trial court, it will not be considered on appeal. There are exceptions, however. In criminal cases, at the discretion of the court, it may be brought at any stage of the proceeding since an act shall not be punished when there is no law punishing it. In civil cases, if necessary for the determination of the case itself, it may be brought any time if the resolution of the constitutional issue is inevitable in resolving the main issue. And third, when the jurisdiction of the court is involved except when there is estoppel. Fourth requisite, the issue of unconstitutionality is unavoidable or the least moot of the case. Petitioner must be able to show that the case cannot be legally resolved unless the constitutional question raised is determined. This requirement is based on the rule that every law has in its favor the presumption of constitutionality. To justify its nullification, there must be a clear and unequivocal breach of the constitution and not one that is doubtful, speculative, or argumentative.